You can turn in your King James Bible to 2 Chronicles 7.14. I've been rather rough on people that have preached this passage in the, in the past, and they, they'll, these big modern church building pastors, they'll come out and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll get all emotional with 2 Chronicles 7.14, and they, I'm not going to bother wasting time with that today. Um, I've done it in the past, but <clears throat> that there's some hope that we can bring America back, make America great again. You've heard that slogan. Um, and we, we can do this. We can do this. And, um, and I say, no, not going to happen. Well, first of all, dispensationally, it's not even written to Christians in the church age. It's written to the nation of Israel, my people, in other words. Um, but let's just go with this today. I do believe that we have a chance. Okay? Now let's actually look at the verse and let's actually go through it. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people which are called by my name... You can apply that to a Christian today, can't you? Sure, Christian. Called by the name of the Lord. You're a Christian. You're of Christ. Shall humble themselves hmm, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Okay, let's look at the verse here. Called by my name there shall humble themselves. Are you proud to be an American? If, you're, if you have pride at all in your life, you can't be humble. Simple. You can say I'm well pleased about something or praise the Lord for whatever else, but the, you can't be have any pride in your life. You have to humble yourself. Oh, we're Americans. We don't deserve this. We, we, you know, we shouldn't have to have our country fall apart and whatever. I'm not proud to be an American. This country's done some really horrible stuff. And I'd leave it and go to some other country, but they're all corrupt. They're all crooked. Proud? Are you proud of your church? Are you proud of your car? Are you proud of your big mortgaged house or whatever else? Um, you have to humble yourself if you want God to heal your land. Part number two of that. And pray. How much time do you spend in prayer? Hmm? You know, there's people out there that literally, you know, all these devil false heretics that are on YouTube. There's not that many in real life. I've never actually met any of these you know, people in real life, even going to church buildings over the years, that, that believe that you can get saved without praying. And they say pray is, prayer is a work. Um, you have to be rather satanic or rather stupid to believe something like that. You know, Prayer is just a natural way of reaching out to God. A lost person reaches out to God and prays. They call upon the Lord. Uh, okay, you know, whatever. Making their videos right now, I'm sure, you know, whatever. But uh, pray. Do you want healing of the of the land? Pray. And I don't mean, you know, God heal our land. It's a bunch of wicked people praying that. I'm talking about you call out to the Lord to be saved. Are the lost people going to do that? All these prayer breakfasts, National Day of Prayer and whatever else. They're not going to do that. Seek my face. Um, what does the Bible say about uh, the invisible God? The Father, He's invisible. And... Um, the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, most people, the vast majority of people, reject the Jesus Christ of this King James Bible. They don't believe in Jesus. They have a problem with the body of God, Jesus Christ. They don't like Him. They'll come out all kinds of stuff. He's the second member of the Trinity, and he's and they just constantly be putting Him down. He's just the Son. He's not as good as the Father. He's just... Slam him down and slam him down and not understanding the context of when Jesus Christ says that. He's talking about his corruptible flesh versus immortal soul. Okay, but people hate the flesh of God. They can't stand him. And the face of God is Jesus Christ. According to the scriptures, the glory of the Lord is in Jesus Christ. Huh, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. How much time do you have... <laughs> that we could list the wicked ways of this country or any country nowadays. I see these guys out there, you know, and they're comparing themselves to the founding fathers, you know, the, the, the um, we're part of the Proud Boys or the, you know, alt-right or some of these other movements and whatever. We're going to stand for America. Um, and you're comparing yourself to the founding fathers. Oh, you mean the men that were righteous? The men who would pray? The men who wouldn't be caught dead with some of these wicked guys? 
tattooed, you know, foul mouthed, just wicked fornicators. And they're just the same line as the founding fathers because they're willing to take up guns and fight for their country. I don't think so. I don't think so. The founding fathers would have gotten nowhere had it not been for them having beliefs in the scriptures and submitting to the scriptures and being upright, moral men. Don't even tell me about it. All these guys, you know, oh, we're going to stand for this country. No, you're not. <laughs> um, I'm all for, you know, standing for a nation and upholding national identity and things and not getting entangled in foreign affairs. And I'm for what was originally set up here in America. But to say that we can bring in the same thing, we'll have some kind of revolution or whatever, and we can bring the same thing. No, you can't. No, you can't. Not without Jesus Christ. And these people are definitely without Jesus Christ. Turn from their wicked ways. I mean, where do you even begin? Just with America. I'm an American right now, living in America, speaking to Americans and people from other countries. I mean, you can apply a lot to your country too, but where do you even begin? Turning from their wicked ways. My goodness. Get rid of, of sodomite marriage. Get rid of the, drive the sodomites out of the land like they did in the Old Testament. Um, get rid of pornography. Get rid of television. Get rid of alcohol, you know, abuse and things like that. I'm not against, you know, certain types of fermented beverages and things, fermented, very finely fermented wines and whatnot. The Bible doesn't speak against those things completely. Understanding there. I've avoid them. I avoid all of it because it's pointless to even try to drink it. But the point is, there's a lot of things that we would have to turn away from. Is it going to happen? No. All these people, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're supporting a guy, Donald Trump, who's lived an extremely wicked life fornicating, adulterer, and this guy's the guy who's going to make America great again. Uh-huh. And professing Christians just Trump fanatics and whatever else, and I see these Trump flags and they got profanity and no more BS on it. And I'm thinking, and these people are going to bring this country back. These are the same people that will cry Second Chronicles 7.14. Um... You say, what are you saying, Brian? Is there a chance that we could do 2 Chronicles 7.14? Sure, it's written. God would heal the land, but uh, is it going to happen? No, it's not. It's just simply not. There's too much. This country has gone too far. Um, this nation is going to be turned into hell. Absolutely. Revelation chapter 6. You say, well, then I guess we'll just, you know, we'll get real nihilistic and just kind of say, well... There's no point. It's been prophesied, brethren. We're, there, there's just no hope. Just why bother doing anything? Well, let me give you a little ray of hope. Okay? If you're a member of the body of Christ out there, there is a cause for you. There is something that's coming in the future. All right? Now, the Bible teaches very plainly that the body of Christ is caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, and you can watch all my studies on that. I've done years of research. I've answered every argument that the posties can come up, out with and ones that they ca haven't even thought of yet. <laughs> okay, there is no scripture saying that the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, because it's for Israel. Jacob, you know, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. There's no term the great tribulation or the tribulation in the entire King James Bible as a title for that time period that's coming. It's a description that there would be great tribulation, bad times in other words, but it's not the title. The title was the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? A lot of people are ignorant on that issue. Um, so don't even do your little posty comments and whatever else. Don't waste my time. I've done the research. I've done the studies. It's been one of the biggest things, my biggest doctrinal stands, probably the biggest thing I've preached about over the years. You have no excuse. If you really want to know the truth, I've proved it time and time again. I've answered all your questions, okay? Spend the time and do the study. All right? But uh, we are up in heaven in Revelation 4 and Revelation chapter 5. You can clearly see the body of Christ there, okay? Uh, again, I've proved that in other studies, and I won't go over it here. But what happens in Revelation chapter 6? One of the seals that's opened. Verse 9, Revelation 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were 
should be fulfilled. So how is it that we have so many wicked people nowadays, and yet in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're willing to die for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ? What happened? What happened? You say, well, the, the, when the rapture happens, then everybody will be convinced. Well, I've been saying that for a long time, and that certainly is true. That will be the final, oh, wow, big spiritual, next big spiritual event to happen is the catching up of the body of Christ. And the, I think the children are going to be leaving as well. But uh, there's another angle to this, which a lot of us haven't thought of. And that is, when you study a lot of the lost people, what a lot of lost people are saying, you'll hear little snippets of truth. You'll hear little things that they're starting to kind of come out of that deception. But it's just they're just not there yet. There's New Agers right now that are willing to die for the truth. But they just don't get the connection between true salvation true Jesus Christ, the true word of God. They don't quite get it. They still associate Christianity with Roman Catholicism. And they say, I don't want anything to do with that. So what changes? What's just the rapture? Well, maybe. But I'll tell you what. You and I have a testimony that we're going to be leaving behind. And our testimony can be one of power. And a little small remnant little small number of truly saved born again believers we can leave a testimony behind that can really shake up this world what did they say to the early christians there in the book of acts you're turning the world upside down paul you know what are you doing you're, you're turning everything upside down you're just changing the whole world just a couple people small little group what could we do you see, we're not going to bring this country back. We're not going to have a Second Chronicles seven fourteen, and God's going to start blessing Americans again, and we're going to get all of our debts paid off. We're going back under the gold standard, and we're going to have gold coins in the stores, and we're going to have white picket fences and swimming pools in every backyard, and you know, uh, whatever brand new Volkswagen Beetles in the lane, like Hitler promised uh, to his people. You know, the Volkswagen, uh, the the people, you know, the car for the common people, essentially. Um, Remember, Hitler did that. And it, well, some of what Hitler said, by the way, was good. Okay? It wasn't, you know, people, history focuses on the anti Jewish stuff, which was evil and wicked. But you know what? He was doing nationalism, national socialism. I know one of you brought that up in the comments on the how Catholics use, you know, fascism and communism. Yeah, it was national socialism that was the Nazi movement. There's some good things to nationalism. Okay? I'm not against all that. Just to clarify. But uh, we're not going back into some kind of a system like that. Some kind of a, you know, star-spangled banner ra waving the flag and whatever. We're doing some really wicked stuff in this country. America's a very wicked nation. But we as Christians can leave behind a testimony. We can fight these things and just say, I'm not going to submit to these new standards. I'm not going to go along with this communistic government that's coming in here. What happens if all of a sudden they start to come after Bible-believing Christians? And they start to put people like me in prison or assassinate people like me. All of a sudden, people are going to start seeing, hey, you know what? There's, these Catholics are going after this certain group of people. And then the catching up happens and those that are left go up. Huh. And all of a sudden, these people are saying, okay, yeah, I'm seeing it. These Bible believers, they stood for the truth. They wouldn't compromise. And that's why these Catholics were so vehement and so went after them with such bloodlust. I think I better become one of those. And let me just say this too. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there isn't going to be any kind of a thing of a long time that you just have to live for the Lord in this long life of sanctification and everything else. I think quite a few of the uh, testimonies that will happen in that time, quite a few of the salvations, a lot of them, actually, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, I think a lot of them, it's just going to be, are you going to take the mark or are you going to go over here to the guillotine and have your head cut off? They already have the guillotines, by the way. Uh, you'll hear stories of that. But uh, I think it's just going to be a very quick decision. They're not going to have to learn a lot of the old hymns or learn a lot of whatever. They're just going to die for this book here. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you say, well, you know, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. 
you know, how can they keep the commandments of God? How can that happen? Well, because it's not going to be very long. It's not going to be a long life of sanctification and whatever else and, and things. It's going to be rather quick. Rather quick and, and uh, I don't know if you could say painful, because cutting your, getting your head cut off probably would only last for a few seconds and then you're with the Lord. But uh, it's going to be some pretty crazy stuff in the future. Now let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples, people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Hmm. There's a great number which no man could, or great multitude which no man could number. But over in Revelation chapter 5 the number is given. 10,000 times 10,000 of the angels. And the resurrection, we are as the angels of God in heaven. These people don't have that same promise. They're given a different promise for the future and into the, you know, in, into eternity. Say it that way. Hmm. And we'll see here as we continue through this that John and one of the 24 elders, as they're talking, they're not saying, hey, these are Christians here. You know, we, they're saying they we'll see that there's a big distinction made. But what do you have here? You have the people that get killed in the time of Jacob's trouble. Those saints that happened in that time. And look who we have next. Verse 11. And, the, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever Amen. The angels and the 24 elders. Study it. Revelation chapter 5. Just go back there real quickly just to show you here. Another one of the great ways to kick the whole post-trib system. Revelation 5 verse 9, talking about the, the 24 elders. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So they have rewards, millennial inheritance rewards, right there. They are crowned, by the way, so judgment seat of Christ as well. And they came out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. These aren't Jews. The 24 elders are not 24 Jews. That is a lie. If you study it out, Deuteronomy chapter 32, there's God separates the bounds. He sets the bounds of the nations as 12, the number of 12. What's 24? 12 times 2. Two elders from each of the 12 boundaries. It's simple. They tell you who they are out of every people, tongue, kindred, nation. God has 12 of them. Okay? Two from each. Very simple. It's not difficult. All these commentators, we're not really sure who it is. Well, I don't know their names, you know. Yeah, I don't know their names, but you know what? I know that they're basically just two from each of the 12 boundaries. It's right there. But what are they doing in heaven before the Antichrist is released in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1? If there's nobody, if nobody gets called up, you know, to be with the Lord, until halfway through the tribula you know, the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, or at the end, then what are these people doing there? The 24 elders, and then the angels that come after that. So the number of them is given, you see. But there's a great multitude which no man could number in Revelation chapter 7. And as we continue, you'll see the distinction between John, who is part of the body of Christ, and the 24 elder, who is part of the body of Christ, and these other people. And by the way, I'd also like to point out the fact that Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 down through verse 8 is talking about Jews, 144,000 Jews that are sealed. Um, and then you have Gentiles that come after that. But I thought Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says in Christ that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one. Why is there a distinction in Revelation chapter 7 if it's just Christians? It's not Christians. It's saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble. Proven. You can't handle it? Well, that's probably because you're lost and you don't understand spiritual things. Verse 12. 
uh, excuse me, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? What are these? Why would you say that about your brothers and sisters in Christ, if they're part of the body of Christ? What are these? Whence came they? Where'd they come from? Are we needing to really ask that question when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ in heaven? No. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. John says, Sir, thou knowest. Kind of like he's saying, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who they are. Well, John, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't you get it? No, they're not in Christ. They're resurrected saints from the time of Jacob's trouble. Saints that had their testimony very quickly, you know, that I'm not taking the mark. I'm not going to worship the beast or his image. Okay, go cut their head off. They're slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they hold. Do you get it? Revelation chapter 6. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <sighs> and some snow on my Bible here. Um, they have washed their robes. They have washed their robes? I thought we are washed as Christians. Huh. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I am. I don't have to wash my robes. What is washing your robe? Is it a work? Yes. They're going to have to earn their righteousness. You see? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, right now, uh, as a Christian, you're going to have your times of working for the Lord and serving the Lord and whatever else. And you might do a pretty poor job and it's going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. But in that future time period, after the body of Christ is gone, those people don't have eternal security. If they take the mark, they lose everything. Okay, you can prove that easily from Scripture. These people in that time period, they're going to have to wash their robes. They're going to have to have their own righteousness in the sense of, I can't take the mark. I have to maintain that testimony of Jesus Christ. I have to get to the point where I, they take me up there and they say, okay, we caught you. We're here now. Last chance. Will you recant your beliefs? Will you take the mark and worship the beast in his image? Because if not, we're going to take you over and kill you. Now, if they say, okay, I will. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take it. All right, I'll worship the beast. Okay, boom, you're done. Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11 teaches that. If any man takes that mark and worships the beast in his image, he gets God's wrath, period. Well, no, I'm, I'm sealed with, under the day, day of redemption. That's for a Christian. That's not for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have to get these things sorted out. Right division of the Word of God. And if you don't get that right division, you make a mess of the Bible. <clears throat> Verse 15, Therefore they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. <sighs> them, them, they, they. Well, they're just members of the body of Christ, Brother Brian. No, they're not. No, they are not. Okay? Uh, they're not members of the body of Christ. It's a different group. You say, what does this have to do with Second Chronicles 7.14 again? <laughs> We got off topic, didn't we? No, not really. Uh, we didn't really get off topic. We stayed on the topic, and that is we can have an impact on that future group. It isn't just this, oh boy, oh man, I, you know, we're just, everything's going to fall apart, and we're going to die, and we're going to get hauled off to the camps and just get killed. And Whatever happens to you in the future, it can be a testimony to the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Think about that. A great multitude gets saved. What great rewards we can have as Christians if we leave behind a powerful testimony, a testimony of people that would not submit to the wicked rules that are coming, a testimony of people that might, God might give you an opportunity to be out at a store someplace and they say, you have to take the vaccine and you say, I will not take the vaccine because it's laying the way for the mark of the beast. And everybody laughs at you. 
hey, uh, come on in. We have a, a company-wide meeting today. Um, the vaccine is out. We have it here. We're going to be rolling it out. We'd like everybody to line up. We want you to take the vaccine. Are there any objections? You better stand up, Christian. You better stand up. You say, but brother, I'd lose my job. That's the whole point. Lose your job. Lose your life for Jesus Christ's sake. And the people will look at you like you're weird. I'm not taking that vaccine. This is paving the way for the mark of the beast. I am not doing this. The Bible says no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Okay, okay, just sit down. Okay, you, you know what? You keep this up, you're going to be fired. You can fire me all you want to. God will provide my needs. I'm not taking this. What a testimony you could leave behind. Catching up happens whenever that would happen, whenever it occurs, whenever the Lord says, okay, that's enough. Time to come home. Body of Christ. Time to come home. And you go home to be with the Lord and those people that you worked with, the people that you knew, they'll say, that nutty old so-and-so, this is what they were talking about. I'm not taking this thing. That's what they meant. Be encouraged, brethren. Second Chronicles 7.14 is not happening. It's not happening. We're not going to bring America, you know, cleanse our land and all this stuff. Not happening. Not going to, no, there'll be just no way. Okay? Um, leaving behind a powerful testimony because you won't conform to the evil, the tyranny that's going on. Now we're talking. Now we can get something that we can kind of sink our teeth into, spiritually speaking here. Okay? Let's take strong stands. Let's not conform to what they're trying to make happen in this world. All right? I do hope you take heed to this. Uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand in the evil day. Okay? Quoting from memory there. Excuse me if I got some of my words wrong. We have to stand, brethren. I pray that you take heed to this and I pray that you will stand in the evil day because it's here. Thank you for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.